One of the things that we recommend for all clients, if you're going to purchase an aircraft in the U.S., is to send a Canadian maintenance engineer down across the border to view the aircraft and do your pre-buy for you. Welcome to Flying BC, a podcast about the people, planes, and aviation adventures in British Columbia and Canada, with your host, Warwick Patterson. Hey, loyal listeners, welcome back. You may have noticed that only a week has gone by since the last episode, and I'm happy to say that I'm going to try and move to a weekly schedule from now on. It definitely takes a fair bit of time scheduling, recording, and editing the shows, but I feel we're on a roll now, so why not ramp things up? As I mentioned on previous episodes, I'm giving away a Flying BC patch to lucky listeners each episode. All you have to do is review the show on iTunes or Facebook, and you're in the running. This week, K Briggs 1988 and Canada Patty are the lucky winners. Fire me an email at podcast at flyingbc.com with your address, and let me know if you want Velcro or non-Velcro backing. If you like the show, please share it on your social channels and follow me on Instagram at Flying British Columbia. I've had my license for just about four years now, and in that time I've bought two planes and I've sold one, which, based on the number of people coming to me for advice, means I must be an expert in the matter. I can say I've experienced the full range of ownership emotions. But on this episode, I thought I'd bring in someone who knows a lot more about buying and selling airplanes to answer your burning questions. Michael Wilton is the president of Flight Simple Aircraft Sales, and his job as a broker is to help pilots navigate the world of buying and selling an aircraft. I asked Michael to walk us through the steps people should take when buying a plane, the pitfalls to avoid, and answer some of the listener questions about importing from the USA and whether buying for time building or in partnerships is a good idea. So sit back, click the autopilot on, and enjoy the show. So Michael, thank you for joining me on the show and uh, welcome to Flying BC. Yeah, thanks very much for inviting me to work. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I've had a ton of questions, people emailing me because I've I've sold a plane and bought a plane this year. So people are asking me questions about what to do with buying and selling. And I'm like, well, I've only done it twice, really. So I thought I'd bring the expert on. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, uh, you know, that vote of confidence in us for sure. Um, yeah, I, I really, that tends to be where most people get their information, certainly initially and, and usually within their first couple of purchases for sure. Yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about your background and uh, where you come from in aviation and how you got to being doing what you do now. You betcha. Yeah. I uh, started in aviation at a young age. My dad was a pilot. Um, both my grandfathers were pilots. Uh, one was a flying doctor in Manitoba, my mom's dad. Uh, and so we were exposed to aviation pretty early on. I grew up in Saskatchewan in uh, a town called Swift Current, uh, not too far kind of between uh, Maple Creek and Regina. And uh, so quite often we traveled to family in Manitoba via airplane. So we grew up essentially in, uh, in a Cessna 310 uh, dealing with GA aviation at all times. Um, so yeah, I just, I grew up and did other things and kind of lost interest in the bug. Um, a few years ago, I guess about 10 years ago now, uh, I decided at that point in my life, I was going to get my pilot's license and get back into flying. Um, a bit in memory of my dad, he was killed in his Bonanza. Uh, in a crash in the U.S., uh, unfortunately, but uh, helped to motivate me to say, you know what, this is something I've always wanted to do. Maybe it's it's time to do that now. Uh, so yeah, I started out just uh, getting a pilot's license and being a pilot and being an owner. To be honest, I bought an, my first airplane uh, about halfway through my training. Uh, finished off my training in that aircraft. Uh, at that point, my family was growing and my travel needs were were different. So we uh, moved up to a larger aircraft. I bought a, a twin Cessna. I uh, flew that for about six years, uh, really enjoyed the airplane, uh, changes again in mission, uh, decided to sell that airplane, and I currently own a 1981 Mooney uh, M20K, uh, a turbocharged airplane, which I use most extensively for business and also for some personal travel. Um, I was working in a diff totally different industry at the time uh, about seven years ago. Um, I happened by chance to stumble into uh, uh, another broker uh, here in Alberta and got the opportunity to work with them. 
and uh, about a year and a half ago broke away and started Flight Simple Aircraft Sales, which is my my brokerage firm. And uh, we really haven't looked back. We've had uh, amazing growth and really exciting times thanks to a lot of great customers just like yourself. <laughs> Yeah, full, full disclosure, I did sell my plane through you. So <laughs> we'll get that out up front. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a great experience. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Great. Um, and I think on this episode, we'll focus a little more on buying than selling. But I think sellers can learn a lot about how to put their best foot forward and how to present their plane. And th they'll learn a lot from this too. For sure. So when someone starts thinking about buying a plane... Uh, what are the, some of the things they should keep in mind, like high level things um, like mission, budget, things like that? Yeah, I think you've hit on kind of the two most important points. Uh, one is a definition of your mission. Um, you know, we could all use three airplanes. We could use uh, a really fun little tail dragger on weekends. We could use a kind of intermediate airplane in the middle and we could all use a jet to go to the Bahamas. Uh, realistically, for 99% of us, that's not going to work uh, just for cost and operations wise. Uh, but the idea is to come up with your mission profile as best you can. So what airplane is going to do as much as 90% or somewhere in there of your mission. So if your mission is tends to be, um, you know, local flying, enjoyable days on weekends sort of thing, that's your focus. You know, you may need an airplane that goes longer distances once in a while, but really focusing on what you're going to use it most for is the critical piece to getting the most enjoyment out of the ownership experience. A budget, then it becomes number two. Um, we always say to clients, when you buy an airplane, that's kind of the cheapest part of the process, right? Uh, upkeep, maintenance, annuals, that sort of thing. There's a lot of costs involved in aviation, especially in GA, and especially because the fleet is aging considerably for the most part. You know, a brand new Cirrus is, uh, is a lot of money. So most of us can't be in that situation. We're buying aircraft that are 60s, 70s, 80s vintage. Um, so the key is to buy as much airplane as you can for your budget, knowing that you've got some costs. We also recommend, you know, to customers, your first two annuals are going to be terrible. You're going to hate aviation after those two meetings with your mechanic. Um, that's pretty common. Um, one of the things you're doing is getting catch up maintenance done. So maybe something that the seller hadn't done previously or a few things, but you're also tailoring the aircraft to your requirements. So, you're upgrading transponders or you're upgrading radios, you're putting in a GPS, that sort of thing. So those are kind of the two major focuses. What is my mission? And then what is my budget to try to get to that? Yeah, I've always been, I've been telling people that like, kind of plan to have an extra 10 grand in your back pocket that first year for radios, whatever, like all those things that pop up because there's even the best plane you're going to find is still going to have things you need to do. And that's a great point. Yeah, we tell that to customers all the time as well. It's going to be a great airplane, but it's not going to be perfect for you until you actually start to fly and use it for yourself. And quite often at that point, there's a few upgrades or some changes that, that every owner wants to make. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I was thinking to insurance, kind of doing your research on insurance in advance is probably a good thing because I actually bought, why well, I didn't buy them all up first, but I had checked insurance and a couple of them wouldn't even cover me because they didn't have a lot of tail wheel time. They couldn't get a quote for me. So that's that's important if you're jumping from PPL straight into some high performance thing. You may not get coverage. That's an excellent point. And in fact, what we're seeing in the insurance industry right now is a lot of insurance companies are getting out of the business. Um, one thing that does that does is drives up insurance premiums for everybody because there's just less competition in that business. But you're absolutely right. You know, if you're going from a 172 to, you know, a Citation jet, you know, there's going to be some insurance implications there for sure. Uh, it's important to know, too, if you're going to end up with a whole bunch of additional training costs to get to the point where your insurance company is going to be comfortable signing you off as, um, you know, to do solo work in the airplane. That's something to factor into your buying process as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Whether you need a rating for it or 20 hours tail wheel or something. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so where should people start in the process of buying a plane? We tell customers the best thing to do is sit down, figure out your mission first, then sit down, figure out your budget, then start shopping, you know, what we affectionately call the airplane porn, right? The, the websites like controller, trade a plane, those sorts of things where you can see aircraft for sale. Um, for the most part, we all get into the trap of being really excited, uh, 
to pick an airplane or to look at airplanes and that's okay but we need to make sure that we temper that with by the way this is our mission and this is our budget and we need to make sure that we stay as best we can within those parameters. Sometimes you can adjust your budget to get a better airplane for the mission. Sometimes you can tailor the mission to fit within your budget. But those are kind of the keys. That's your good starting point. It's going to give you an idea of what the market looks like right now. It's going to give you an idea of what airplanes that fit your mission are going to look like as far as cost-wise go. But the critical piece, too, is do some research. Uh, you know, I happen to be a low-wing guy. Um, you know, you're a high wing guy. Um, nothing wrong with either one of those. Uh, I fly a Mooney, mostly tarmac to tarmac, and you fly a mall, which can do lots of great off airport stuff. So again, very different missions. I wouldn't be looking for a mall if I was buying an airplane because my mission doesn't make sense for that. But if your mission makes sense for that, you're not going to necessarily buy a Mooney to want to park it on some gravel bars. So that's really, really an important part of the process. Cool. What are some of the most common pitfalls or mistakes you see first-time buyers making? I guess probably probably branching out of budget and out of mission, I guess. but Yeah, I mean, those are certainly two that do happen. The biggest pitfall I, I find with clients, especially ones that we've helped in the buying process, really is getting too excited about an airplane. It's really hard not to. Uh, I'm a broker and have been for seven and a half, almost eight years now. And I still get excited when it's my option. Um, I got very excited about a Mooney. Uh, in fact, in BC, which was interesting, I went out to see it, did my due diligence, and was still sitting in the airport flying home trying to convince myself it was the right airplane at the right price. And it wasn't the right airplane, and it wasn't at the right price. But even in my own mind, somebody who really should know what the biggest pitfall is, which is falling in love with the airplane you see, I should have known better. Luckily, I had some people on the outside that said, hey, by the way, don't fall in love. Make sure it's the right airplane. I decided to pass on that aircraft, and I ended up getting a, an even better aircraft at a better price with better avionics and more of my mission profile in it, uh, and that's the one that we've owned for the last three years. That seems to happen a lot. You, you, you're like, oh, that's the one. I want that one, and then you get all depressed when it doesn't happen, but then, yeah, two, one or two more will pop up again. And it kind of narrows your focus. You got you go through the process with one, and suddenly you know a lot more about that type of airplane, and you find more. Absolutely. And the other thing is, you talk to the pilots around you, and every pilot has this, you know, a different opinion on what is better. Some love high wing, some love low wing. I tend to hit my head on high wing airplanes. It's not because they're bad airplanes; it's because I'm tall and I don't like high wing airplanes for that reason. But having those other pilots to sit down and hey, you know, here's my mission. This is what I'm thinking. Take those opinions in, and with a grain of salt, of course, but take those opinions in and then, you know, make your decision from there. If you look at one airplane and say that's the one, without doing your due diligence, it can usually lead to a, a disappointing ownership experience, at least initially anyway. And I think talking to people is super key too because you sometimes find the best planes through word of mouth. They're not posted on the web. They're not for sale. Um, I found them all that way. Somebody I'd been talking to, they just knew I was looking for a mall. And they said, have you talked to this guy? And sure enough, he hadn't posted for sale, but it was he was ready to sell. So Absolutely. And that quite often happens. You know, folks will be thinking about selling their aircraft, but they haven't really got to the point where they're, you know, mentally ready to give up the aircraft, uh, even though they may have to. I had a client um, that, you know, medically was having troubles and needed to sell the airplane, uh, but was hanging on. Uh, for that exact reason. And one of my other clients called him and got us together. But same side, same sort of thing, you know, quite often a pilot's not ready, but things like the BCGA and the other kind of groups around can really help get the word out, especially if you're looking for something that's very specific and especially if you're looking for something local. Um, you know, we work across the country and in through the U.S. and in fact all over the world. But if you can find a local airplane that's operated by, or sorry, is maintained by a maintenance facility that you maybe know, or have a, had a chance to chat with, it really makes that process a lot easier. Yeah, cool. Um, so they found if somebody finds the model they want, they've actually looked at a couple of examples for sale. What's next? Um, are there some key questions or information you should get from the seller right off the bat? For sure, yeah. The critical first question is, you know, can you show me the logbooks? Uh, we say to clients, 
you know, when we go out to do a listing for a sale of an aircraft, we need all of their documentation and we digitize all of that. It's a lot of work, takes a lot of effort. A lot of private sellers don't want to have to do it, but it also makes it easier, easier for them to sell the aircraft because buyers can look at that log information. The first question I've been getting for the last seven and a half, eight years, show me the log books. What do the log books look like? Do you have the log books digitally? That should be your first, first thing to look at. Uh, next thing is, you know, to, to do some research on the airplane itself. Um, you know, take a look through those log books, have a conversation with the mechanic that you trust. Hey, I saw this in the books, that sort of thing. Uh, once you get to the point where, you know, you think that you've got an opportunity to purchase the aircraft, uh, put together a really comprehensive document on how you're going to buy the airplane. So what is the process going to look like? Who's going to hold the money? How is the money going to transfer? How is the ownership going to transfer? That's all critical. A, it protects you, the buyer, but B, it also protects the seller. And so you're both going to have a more mutually agreeable process if you've got that laid out. And don't be afraid of, you know, you don't, it doesn't have to have a lot of legal jargon in there, but it needs to be able to say, hey, if we had to sit down in front of a judge, would your requirements and my requirements would they have been met by this document and that's really critical and that's kind of the first step so that's the offer step um, we recommend that everybody does a pre-buy i've had aircraft that have just come out of annual you know five days out of annual we still conduct a pre-buy it's critical that you have a mechanic you know and trust or a mechanic that's at least has no vested interest in the aircraft so we work with a lot of maintenance facilities across Canada to help set up pre-buys. But at that point, we do the introduction and then the maintenance facility and the buyer have the conversation. What do you want looked at? What do you want the pre-buy to look at? Is there anything specific? We take a step back at that point when in our sales contracts because it's not our business at that point. It's between the buyer and the maintenance facility. And that's critical. You need to have that very hands-off, very open dialogue between those two parties to make sure that people get what they need out of that pre-purchase inspection. Uh, very right. seldom do aircraft go not go through a pre-purchase as part of a sale, and I would recommend a pre-purchase to every customer out there. Yeah, and definitely a, a fresh set of eyes, not the same mechanic who's been working on it for 15 years. <laughs> exactly, and that, may, that mechanic may be brilliant. It might be a great yeah. mechanic and a great wrench. Uh, the issue is quite often, and we all fall into this trap, that you see the same thing over and over and you tend to miss the little things that are coming up. So a fresh set of eyes is going to give you a very clear indication of what really looks like under the hood of that airplane. And generally it's the buyer who's paying for the pre-buy inspection, right? That's correct. Yeah, we recommend usually for most buyers, uh, depending on the airplane, but uh, a single engine, standard single engine airplane is going to run somewhere between $1,000 and $1,500 on average. Um, and that changes with the scope. So if you're looking for very specific things, if you want to have a very in-depth log search or something like that done, you know, that that changes as the requirements go up. I've seen pre-buys that are three or $4,000. I've seen pre-buys that have gone for 500 bucks. It really comes down to what the buyer's scope needs to be. Most mechanics have kind of a basic under, you know, basic layout of what they would do at a pre-buy. But if you have specific things or there's a specific thing on the aircraft, you know, after you've done your research and you know, you have to check this item or that item, that's important to have in part of your pre-buy as well. And kind of the, the minimum is probably checking the ADs and making sure all the mandatory inspections are done. You bet. Yeah. Compressions, that sort of thing. The great system we have in Canada is that ADs, you know, no mechanic will sign off on an aircraft with an AD that is not in compliance. Uh, or if they do, you probably don't want to buy the airplane anyway. Um, or you don't want to have your pre-buy there either. I haven't met one yet, which is great. Um, they all are very interested in the safety of GA including the safety of a buyer of an airplane that they've done a pre-buy on. Yeah, right. Um, so there's a lot of numbers. You look at ads online and things like that. There's like uh, SMOH, uh, STOH, SPOH, TVO. <laughs> um, for somebody kind of new to the buying game, it can be overwhelming. Um, sure. Can you run through some of those crucial numbers, the ones that are important and um, – what, what weight they carry in looking at planes? Absolutely. There's the two that we find the most critical are total time and service. So uh, total time uh, since new for the aircraft. So that's the airframe hours for the most part, uh, depending on the airplane. Um, 
you know, something that's flown 10 to 12,000 hours from the 70s, chances are was a trainer of some sort, uh, you know, or a uh, commercially operated aircraft. Most GA aircraft don't fly more than 25 to 30 hours a year. So something in that four to 5,000 hour range is kind of average for pretty, uh, pretty average for a single GA airplane nowadays, or even a light twin. Um, the next one you're really going to want to watch for is the uh, time since major overhaul. So that's MO, SMOH. Um, so that's the last time the aircraft was broken down and overhauled. Overhauls are a critical component and especially a concern if you're looking at aircraft in the U.S. So the U.S. has a different policy of engine overhaul than we do here in Canada. And in some cases, the aircraft in the U.S. could have had a major overhaul, quote unquote, and it turns out that it's not applicable here in Canada, which will create a situation where you think you're buying a low time engine and Transport Canada will come along and say, no, it's not allowed. Uh, that is kind of a critical component and can be a big gotcha if you're buying an airplane out of the U.S. Uh, interesting. You betcha. Uh, um, prop so overhaul. That's just, oh, sorry. Go ahead. We, we just have a, a more in-depth overhaul checklist, I guess, in Canada or? What we have really work is a really specific requirement to meet for an engine overhaul here in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. The U.S. has a, a little broader scope in their FAA system and a lot more opportunity to do things like field overhauls, um, you right. know, 337s, 8130s, that sort of thing. Canada does not have um, as loose a system. I, I, I use that word kind of tongue in cheek. The, the U.S. has a lot more robust situation around, hey, you can do things. It just has to be checked by the right person. Here in Canada, we just don't have the people in the Transport Canada program to be going out and saying, yeah, that light bulb or that fitting or that, you know, fairing, we can check that off as being field approved because, you know, I came out to see it today. We just don't have that ability with the size of our country and the, the minimal people that we have working for Transport Canada. Uh, next so one you we'll want to come, take a look we'll, at is oh, yeah sorry. we'll come back to that yeah we'll come back to that a little bit later when we talk about buying in and out of the states because those are some of the gotchas so. you betcha absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the other things you want to watch for Canada does have a requirement for every ten years you have to overhaul your propeller whether there's one hour on it or twenty thousand hours on it um, so that is something you have to be aware of. Uh, it's not a showstopper. I mean, we break down propellers usually with, you know, only a few hundred hours on them for the most part in GA after the 10 year requirement. But if you're buying an aircraft and the prop is due, you know, within the next six months or four months, you're looking at anywhere between, you know, six and $12,000, depending on what kind of propeller it is. So that's something just to keep in the back of your mind. You know, a few years out, it's not so bad. But realistically, that calendar will likely run out long before the kind of, you know, time before overhaul on the prop, quote unquote. Right. Okay. And then um, then I guess you kind of have to do a little bit of research on each different engine, what the time before overhaul is. And it, it's not a hard and fast rule that you have to overhaul it at TVO, but um, it's a good, it seems like it's a good guideline for price of aircraft and things. Absolutely. And it's an indicator. I mean, it is set by the manufacturer and actually they've been revised multiple times. So um, there are two relatively new documents. I think it's, one is 97-4 and the other came out in 2005, I believe, for the two major overhaul or two major manufacturers like Homing and Continental, um, where the T time before overhaul, the TBO, can be adjusted in certain aspects. Uh, some airplanes had a TBO of say 1600 hours originally, and because the fleet is so large and the um, cross section of aircraft that they've been able to see at overhaul is getting so big that they've actually increased the TBO of major engines. So it's important to check that number. I have seen it where um, folks have quoted, you know, 2000 hour because that's kind of the standard for most engines. Uh, and it's actually as low as 1400. So it is something you need to do a little bit of research on. You, like you said, it's not a hard and fast rule. You do not have to overhaul the engine, you know, on the hour 2000 or on a 12 year cycle, unless you have an aircraft operating in commercial services, that's a different animal. But for GA pilots and uh, car 625, uh, we don't have to do an overhaul right at TBO. Um, I've seen engines run as high as 26, 2700 hours. I flew an aircraft to Alaska to drop it off for a customer. I had 2700 hours on it 
uh, and it's supposed to have 2000 before overhaul. So, you know, and it ran strong and it was a great little airplane to fly. So yeah, it's not a hard and fast rule. We say to folks, you know, don't overhaul or don't break open an air aircraft engine unnecessarily. Um, you know, there's a lot of technology that's gone into oils and lubricants and that sort of thing since that aircraft was originally certified. And that is what it is. So, you know, if you got an engine that was originally certified back in the seventies, that's where the TBO came from. Not the fact that, you know, there's 4,000 of them in the fleet running to 25, 26, 2700 hours all the time. So, right. Cool. So do you have a few telltale signs, uh, that a plane is worth looking at or vice versa, a few telltale signs that you should run away? Yeah, I don't think I've ever had one where I would say, you know, off the cuff run away. But there are some, you know, some things that we do look for. Uh, aircraft with a full log history right now, that's important. Uh, we do see some cyclical things in aviation where, you know, today it's important, tomorrow it's not as important, that sort of thing. But for the most part right now, log history is a big one. Uh, if you have an aircraft with a full log history, it's not critical, but it certainly increases the value of the aircraft because you're able to go back from day one from the production flight test and and check it out um the other thing that we say is you know an aircraft that is flown regularly or you know as regular as ga gets um is definitely a better candidate and location is still an important component as well uh, you know on the coast is a little different animal than you know in the middle of uh, saskatchewan uh, it's a lot different climates in those situations. So it's something to kind of keep an eye on. You know, I wouldn't not recommend an aircraft, but I might change my pre-buy if it was, say, in Vancouver or Newfoundland versus one that was in, say, Winnipeg or Regina. And the the coastal atmosphere, you're you're thinking there's more sort of moisture and salt in the air, things Absolutely. like that. Absolutely, yeah. Not, just more yeah. opportunity for corrosion. And again, I'm not saying that the airplane is going to be bad in any way, but certainly something you're going to want to have checked at the pre-buy is is there a potent, or is there any corrosion in the aircraft currently that has not or cannot be treated out? Um, corrosion is a really tough tough one. Um, it does spread just like cancer. It's a terrible stuff. But if it's caught early and it's treated properly, the aircraft can uh, can still be flown very safely and and will last a long time. It's just something that needs to be kept up. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. The we we bought the Cessna, and it hadn't flown very much each year, and it suffered from a lot of the things that happen when those engines sit: little bits of corrosion and stiff piston pin caps, things like that. And uh, we ended up doing an engine overhaul pretty much. So, For sure, yeah. yeah. And that certainly learned. is a risk, absolutely. And, and we can look at some things like borescoping, um, you know, through the uh, through the spark plug holes or looking through the, uh, you know, trying to see the cam for the lobes and things like that. Um, for the most part, you know, we wouldn't say don't buy an airplane, but make sure that you maybe add a few extra items into the pre-purchase inspection just to give yourself peace of mind. Maybe it's a high time engine. You're getting a reduction in price because of that. Uh, really, engine time is the primary driver of the price of aircraft. So, um, you know, an airplane is not worth a ton more with low airframe time if it's got high engine time. So, you know, low airframe time does add to the value of the aircraft, but the higher engine time de detracts from it quite considerably. And well, you certainly know from your experience, engine overhauls are not cheap, especially no. nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> nope, definitely not. Should you always fly before you buy? You believe in that? Yeah, I do believe in that. I think it's worth going up. Um, I don't allow any of my aircraft to fly without a deal in place, a deposit in place. And to be honest with you, I will not uh, personally, and I would never allow one of my customers, my purchasing customers, to fly an aircraft until after the pre-buy. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of that is I want somebody to have a look at that aircraft and make sure it's safe for us to take up and go and fly. Um, it certainly can be beneficial. It's not a critical item um, for most buyers because the aircraft is either going to be good after pre-buy and therefore will fly, or they're probably going to be so excited to be flying it, they're not going to notice any weird nuances. Um, yeah. You know, you're going to see the big stuff. You know, is the yoke canted 45 degrees while you're trying to fly straight? You know, do you have to put a lot of rudder into the aircraft to keep the nose straight. Those kinds of things you can certainly find on a flight test. And it certainly can be good. Um, but I wouldn't say it was a critical item for most buyers. 
The one thing we do say, though, is will not, do not, whatever you do, don't go flying until after the pre-buy. Because if you find out that, uh, you know, the wing bolts are corroded through, it's nice to find that out in the mechanic shop than halfway down a runway somewhere. Yeah. Yep. Um, and what if a plane's out of annual? Um, who should be paying to get that up to date? Should it be done before you buy it or can there be deals done? Yeah, the process is a little different for each airplane. So uh, we do have a lot of airplanes that come to us out of annual. Um, originally, you know, there's a situation in the U.S. where um, it's a lot easier to transfer an aircraft to the U.S. buyer. Um, their import is considerably reduced if they get a fresh annual at the aircraft and we can get it down there kind of right away. Um, so for a lot of times we tell our clients, we'll hold off on the annual until we find a, a buyer for the aircraft. What I'm actually telling clients now is get the airplane into annual and see if you can get some flying into it. So it's more important that the aircraft is being flown even semi-regularly. You know, if you're going up once a, you know, once every even couple of weeks just to get the airplane up moving, cycle the gear, make sure the engine's up to temperature, you know, make sure that oil's burning off the moisture in it. That's more important nowadays than having a, you know, fresh annual on the airplane. Uh, if you do decide to buy an aircraft that is not in annual, pre-buy is still critical. Um, what we would normally do then is we'd come up with a list of what's going to be covered under the annual and what's going to be covered, um, you know, down the road, either as airworthiness items or that the buyer will actually pay for down the road or have an idea of what's down the road. And then the aircraft would go into annual. Now, that annual would be paid by the seller. Um, so we always say, you know, I have customers that say, well, I'm not going to pay for an annual. And I said, well... Unfortunately, you know what the price of an airplane is that can't fly? It's like the price of a car with no wheels on it. You know, <laughs> yeah. If you can't yeah. if you can't operate that piece of machinery as it was intended, it's worth basically nothing. Um, so it's a negotiable item in the thing, but we always say the seller will purchase and put the aircraft through a pre, uh, the annual inspection as part of the deal for sure. Is there any other gotchas to look out for if you're going out there to buy? Is there like you got to do a lean search and things like that? Do you have to worry about that? Yeah, lean searches are excellent to do. Um, unfortunately, in Canada, you have to do them for every province. So if the aircraft is in Ontario, you have to go to Ontario and run an Ontario lean search. Um, there are companies that can do it for you remotely, so it's not a big deal. You can do it kind of over the phone or over a, an email. Uh, but that's definitely a, a good thing to do for an aircraft. Um, the other gotcha that I would say is if somebody is unwilling to share information about the aircraft, um, you know, or only has a few photos or is quite hesitant, you know, if you ask for more information, they're hesitant and I, and certainly not information like, you know, how many owners it had or what was the guy's, you know, third cousin's last name on his mother's side. Tuesday, right? That That's not what I'm thinking. But, you know, if somebody says, oh, yeah, I'm sure I have the logs around here somewhere. I'll just have to dig them up. Or, oh, yeah, you know, I could probably get you some photos, but it's a lot of work to go out to get the airplane and take some photos. Those kinds of things always kind of set my mind off a little bit to say, you know, if you've, if you've decided to sell your aircraft, then you really should be prepared to sell your aircraft. And from a buyer's perspective, it always gets you a little bit concerned if the seller doesn't want to put in some effort. Um, you know, as a prime example, our our aircraft are all listed with multiple photos, videos, and the logbooks digitized. Those are the th you know those are the key components that a buyer is initially going to look at anyway. Um, there's certainly lots of stuff that we can do down the road for additional information. Um, but those are kind of the critical pieces. And if you're, if the seller's unwilling to provide that information for you or to you, that's one of those, well, is this really maybe the aircraft? And it could be that the seller has a kind of an odd personality. We've certainly seen that in the past too. Uh, but certainly something to get your antenna up and just, you know, be on the radar that, you know, this may not be as good an airplane as you hope or as you think it looks on paper and it's going to take some due diligence to find out if it is or if it is not right good there's a lot of information out there good or bad about importing and exporting an aircraft um and as we mentioned earlier there's some gotchas with like 337s that can really mess with a, a buy you bet um 
but the market is a lot bigger in the states for aircraft. A lot, a lot more pilots down there buying aircraft. Can you run through what it takes to buy and sell across the border and what to watch out for there? You betcha. Yeah. Um, the critical piece for purchasing an aircraft out of the U.S. is to go in there eyes wide open, knowing that you're going to have a big bill to get it here. Um, if the airplane is a good price and a good aircraft, and you know, and it can be had at a good deal, absolutely. You can expect somewhere in the eight to twelve thousand dollar range for the average single engine airplane to get it imported into Canada. That includes things like inspection, changing the numbers. Uh, usually requires repaint in the U.S. unless they've stickered. Um, getting an MDM sign off, having your mechanic do all the importation work. Uh, it's pretty onerous. It's a tough process. Um, you know, it's doable for sure. And when the dollar is par, it can be some really, really good deals and good opportunities there. But you're also paying 30% on our dollar right now to buy one across the border and bring it up plus an added, you know, $10,000 on average. Plus it takes, you know, a couple of months to get an aircraft imported properly into Canada. So it has to be a pretty good deal. One of the things that we recommend for all clients, if you're going to purchase an aircraft in the U.S., is to send a Canadian maintenance engineer down across the border to view the aircraft and do your pre-buy for you. And that engineer maybe might not be your engineer. It needs to be someone who is well-versed in what it takes to import an aircraft into Canada. So ideally, the company that you've selected to do the import should have one of their persons go down there and check the aircraft out and do your pre-buy on site. Then they're going to find things like engines that are not applicable, you know, modifications that don't have STCs, that sort of thing. They'll find that before you spend thousands and thousands of dollars to get the aircraft in here and then have a, a minister's delegate go, mm, sorry, we're not going to let that in the country. My brother had an experience, um, luckily happened before I was a broker, but he brought an airplane up from Arizona, beautiful airplane, um, kept it long term. So, you know, it was less painful than somebody who had only, you know, kept one for a couple of years, but he bought it with a fresh engine and that engine found, they found that engine not to be applicable to you, to Canada when it came in. And he had to basically overhaul what was considered a zero time engine. So he paid a premium for a zero time engine in the U S except that it wasn't and he ended up having to re-overhaul the engine when it came to canada so wow. it's really critical to get that work done by that importing mechanic um, facility to make sure you don't get those kinds of problems and those little field mods can catch you out too like 337s in the states the little modifications that might have a piece of paper signed off but you have to totally undo it and sometimes it's not possible to undo those absolutely and a lot of times uh, you know maintenance engineers will say well yeah the 337 is fine but they still have to take it apart check it verify that it meets all the canadian standards then put it back on then write another document for canada to say it's good all of that costs time and money and then the MDM may or may not sign off on it. So it's important that if you can avoid those types of things. The good thing is when you're buying an aircraft out of the U.S., a lot of that stuff you can find in the logbooks. Or you look at the airplane and go, wow, that's really cool. I sure hope that has an STC with it. So <laughs> those are the kinds of things to check initially before you engage your maintenance engineer. Um, but really, we say to folks, if you're going to buy an aircraft out of the U.S., um, it has to be a heck of a good deal these days, and you need to spend the time and the money to send a maintenance engineer down there that's familiar with the Canadian import process to do your pre-buy. It could be the difference between a couple of thousand dollars on the wrong airplane and $50,000 on the wrong airplane. They have a little bit of different logbook requirements too down there, don't they? They're not as detailed as ours up here. They do. Uh, for the most part, the U.S. does not require um, what we would consider the journey log of the aircraft. Some of the American um, pilots do put every flight in their tech records, um, which we used to do in Canada back in the day as well. Uh, but there is no journey log um, in the U.S. So quite often you'll see an entry and then 150 hours and another entry you know, 150 hours or 100 hours or 80 hours. It's very yeah, sporadic. So it's just like right? a, yeah, it's like a maintenance, maintenance log, not a journey log. Exactly. It's just the technical records. Now, realistically, we don't share, uh, for the most part, journey logs for the aircraft we have until we've gotten to the pre-buy stage. 
Um, and that's mostly to protect the privacy of the owners of the aircraft. You know, it shows who was in the aircraft, where they went, you know, how long it took, all that kind of stuff. So we do keep that information back in our sale of aircraft until we get to a pre-purchase inspection stage. And then it's it's released as part of the documentation for the aircraft. But yeah, that's something you won't find across the U.S. So it definitely something to keep an eye on for. Cool. So as we mentioned before, um, I put my Cessna up for sale in sort of August, something like that. Uh, I first put it up as a private seller. You get a lot of tire kickers. Um, you end up answering a lot of emails. And I was just like, you know what? I'm going to try Michael at Flight Simple and list it with him and kind of not deal with this stuff. Um, so tell me a little bit about what you offer and the pros and cons of going with a broker. For sure. The I'll talk a little bit about the simple side of it. So that's the seller side of it. Uh, where, which was what we went through with you. So uh, Flight Simple, our company, prides itself on our customer service ability. One of the things we always tell sellers is, and and this goes for buyers as well, is think of an aircraft, aircraft purchase more like a house purchase and less like an automobile purchase. Um, and we find once that mentality shifts in their mind, both sides of the of the equation get a better feel for what we're doing. So we always say, you know, you wouldn't uh, send photos of your house and get an inspection and do a bunch of nice videos and do some drone shots of your home and then send it to your realtor and then pay your realtor to sell the house. doesn't make a lot of sense. You've done all the work and they collect that commission. We do the same thing. We come to, and we go and see every aircraft that we represent physically we digitize all the log books and all the records. We take all the photos. We take all the videos. Um, for our sales side, it's important that we provide all of the service um, for a seller. Once we've done all that kind of thing, we do all the marketing for the aircraft. We answer all the emails and the phone calls, and there's always a lot of them. Um, we laugh that, you know, there's kind of, you know, 10% of the people who, you know, just want to look at airplanes, and that's okay. Um, there's probably 80% of people who are, interested in aircraft and probably purchasers and they want they have legitimate questions and concerns they want to look at the logbooks that sort of and then there's 10 percent who want to trade you know an old chevelle for your airplane again we deal with all of those we deal with 100 percent of those comments um, but that's really what we do is we try to take that workload off of the seller from the buyer's side and we do do this i'm in the middle of one uh, for a client right now in ontario uh, we also help on the buyer's side so if you have a customer that comes to you and says, hey, you know what, here's my mission. Um, what do you think we can do? Okay, so we'll sit down and we'll hammer out the mission. We set a budget, we figure that out. We start looking at some airplanes. We start chatting about what works, what doesn't. And we try to come up with the right aircraft for that buyer. Um, quite often it is just a lot of manual searching, going through log books and that sort of thing. But realistically, that can help a lot of buyers with the angst of saying, okay, I've had to send out 15 emails today and I've now got 27,000 pages of logbooks to read. And, you know, these three actually don't meet the mission, that sort of thing. So we, we try to also take that workload off on a buyer's standpoint where we say, okay, you tell us what your mission is. Tell us what your budget is. Let us go out and see if we can find something for you. And then we take a, a percentage or a commission of the sale price um, of the final sale price for the aircraft. Usually what we find on our purchasing side for the buyers is that they'll get a better deal, um, you know, through us, which helps to offset that commission. So they're paying us a commission, but they're actually saving money on the purchase of the aircraft. Regardless of whether we're working for the seller side or the buyer side in any of our deals, um, the critical piece is we handle all the paperwork. Uh, we handle all the money transfers. We handle all, you know, organizing inspections. We handle um, arranging for ferry flights if required or, you know, where we're going to pick the airplane up. Um, the biggest thing that really it becomes a headache for most buyers and for most sellers is the paperwork side of it. And again, you want to be protected. As a buyer, you want your money protected before you hand it over to the seller. You know, as a seller, you want to make sure your asset is protected and that you get paid before you hand over the airplane. So that's really what Flight Simple does and really excels in is making sure that both parties are protected, making sure that both parties have a mutually enjoyable experience. But it's really critical to get that right. Otherwise, you know, 
one or both parties can feel like it's a, a bad situation and no one wants to start their air, you know aircraft ownership experience already with a bad taste in their mouth yeah no it definitely it it was much easier doing the handoff when i knew the money was ready to be transferred and i just handed the keys across and then i got the text from you saying okay transferred absolutely yeah and that's critical yeah. i mean you know you're your t- and every one of our customers takes it a lot of faith. Um, part of the reason we go to see every aircraft and meet with our customers too is the opportunity to actually stand with them face to face, so they get a face to the name. You know, we're not some anonymous person on the phone or via email. We want to make sure that you're comfortable, that we have a relationship um, from our selling side, from the buying side as well. I may not meet as many of those customers in person, but Zoom calls, emails, phone calls. Uh, you know, the client that we're working for right now uh, in Ontario, we probably spent three hours on the phone just hashing out mission uh, because it was important that we get that right. Otherwise, we're going to go out and look for airplanes that are all wrong for him and his situation. And, you know, that's not going to be a benefit to anybody. So if somebody wanted to sell their plane through a broker, what can they do to help you sort of maximize their their sale or I guess, I guess just being open to you guys <laughs> digitizing everything. And- Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing what we say to sellers and we say this to every seller that we go out and see is um, p- try and have the airplane as clean as possible. I mean, a better looking airplane makes for better photos. Um, you know, we do have situations. I, I had a funny conversation with an, a gentleman in Florida the other day about one of my airplanes that has a very large snowbank behind and beside it uh, currently that we have listed. And he said, I can't believe you guys fly in this kind of weather. I said, absolutely. I said, it was 42 below when I took those photos in that video out there. It was terrible. But, you know, we didn't have a choice. That's the owner's situation. And we needed to have the aircraft out on the ramp to take those photos. Um, But, yeah, an aircraft that's clean, um, an aircraft that's as tidy inside as possible. Uh, One of the big things is we say to owners, you know, when we come out to do your photos and that sort of stuff, I pull all your personal effects out of the aircraft. So if you're selling headsets with the aircraft, great, leave them in there for the photos. If you're not, take them out uh, because we do have a lot of buyers who will say, well, I saw that headset in the photo. I thought that was part of the airplane. Now we're very specific about our spec sheet. So if headsets are included, they're listed in the spec sheet. So it's not been an issue in the past, but it's just one more thing, you know, to to help kind of clean up that cockpit. Uh, even something as simple as, you know, a quick vacuum in the airplane and a wash of the windows can make a big difference in in the presentability of an aircraft. Um, the other thing is bring everything, every page, every document, every sticky note. We'll decide what we think is necessary and what's not. Uh, you don't have to make that decision, luckily. But it's funny how many owners will see and they bring the logbooks out and then they realize they're missing conformity certificates. They're missing um you know stcs they're missing you know parts of the poh even the c of a and c of r we do digitize those documents so that we always have a digital record of them um we don't post them of course publicly but we keep those in our files so that if it you know five years from now the owner says oh my god i need a copy of that for whatever reason we can easily pull that from our digital archive but even the most minute thing can be you know, overlooked by an owner who's owned an airplane for several years, but it might be something critical that that we're going to get a question on from a potential uh, buyer. And we want to make sure that we're not calling the seller unnecessarily to to get information that we could have got when we were out there. And realistically, you know, come out and and enjoy the process. It's, It's, you know, a lot of work, but we really enjoy doing it. And we want to present your aircraft as best we can. It's important for us to have great photos, great video, great digital logbooks. A flight simple, like I said, comes out to you, to the aircraft. Uh, luckily, that means I get to fly a lot in my own airplane and come to visit my clients. But yeah, it's critical that we do that so that you're not being questioned too many times. If I have something that's really specific, I'll call my sellers. For the most part, we have the no news is good news program. So we're probably working on a whole bunch of stuff in the background, but we don't have to call you regularly to come up with, hey, what about this or what about that item? We try to do all of that up front. Cool. And then I had a few people ask about partnerships and uh, buying a plane for PPL training. Should I buy a plane for training um, or to build time? Should I go into a partnership? Um, what's your take on partnerships and 
that it it makes financial sense on paper, but sometimes you got to be pretty careful about who you go into partnership with. Absolutely. Um, I don't. I've never had a partner in my aircraft. Um, I'm kind of weird about my airplane. It's my airplane, and I'm very. It's yeah. I sell airplanes. Like this, I again, I try to explain to sellers how to go through this process, and yet I'm a real pain in the butt about people coming to sit in my airplane. Like, I just don't like that. I don't want anybody to fly it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I have to check myself and knowing that, you know, partnerships can be excellent. Um, I don't want one, but that's my personality and, and my requirement. The one big thing we've talked to folks about when they say, well, I'm looking into a partnership or I'm thinking of a partnership is make sure you have the right people. Um, you need to interview those folks like you would if they were going to be working as your accountant, say. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to have immense trust. Uh, we recommend that any partnerships do fly together before they enter into the agreement uh, because you want to know that your piloting style and the other partner's piloting styles are going to be in line. You know, if you're a, a Sunday flyer who likes to go up and really ease the airplane down and use the runway to slow down instead of jamming the brakes on, you know, and, and really take care of that aircraft. And then you get, you know, someone who's a little ham fisted in the airplane and they're banging it down. Well, your maintenance costs are going to end up, you know, going through the roof by no fault of your own, uh, you know, just based on your partnership. I've seen some really great partnerships. They're definitely doable out there. But I would say to folks, the best thing to do is interview as if you were interviewing someone who was going to handle your bank account. And that really is kind of what's happening. Yeah. And I think it's important to really trust that person and have a good line of communication because things are going to break on the plane. There's going to be things happen. You just need to be able to talk to that person, frankly, and be like, hey, this broke when I was flying it. We got to get it fixed. Um, you don't want somebody who's going to hide those things away and not tell anybody. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing is a good partnership agreement. So, mm -hmm. you know, who's going to pay for what? How are the hours allocated? Who gets to use the airplane when? What's the schedule going to look like? The more you have that laid out, the better the partnership is. You know, the old saying, is, you know, good fences make good neighbors. Good partnership agreements make good partnerships um, because everybody knows where they stand. And so there's no miscommunication and, and there's no misconstrued situations with that if you have a really good partnership. Uh, switching over to purchasing an aircraft to do your flight training in, um, we think that's a great idea, but we sell airplanes. So, uh, you know, it, it really has to come down to do the numbers make sense. Uh, what we have found is a lot of father-son combinations or father-daughter combinations, uh, or we found families where, you know, one person is a pilot and two or three others want to get their licenses. Those really do make sense because you've got multiple people from the same household flying the airplane, learning to fly. Uh, the one thing that you do have to check really carefully, though, is the flight training unit you're going to be using or the pilot you're going to be using. Are they okay teaching in your aircraft? I was very lucky. I bought an airplane, uh, flew it for half my PPL and my PPL flight test, and my instructor happened to be a consultant for the flight training unit. I happened to be based at the airport he was at. So when he wasn't flying for the flight training unit, he was flying for me basically as my private instructor. Um, so it's important to do that and check that before you decide to buy an airplane because you'd hate to buy an airplane and then find out that no one instructor will train you in the aircraft. Uh, that's yeah. kind of critical. Uh, for time building is a little different. I say for folks, time building in your own airplane is a great idea. Um, one thing with most small single engine airplanes for time building, you're probably only going to put a couple hundred hours on the airplane. It's probably going to be pretty much worth what you paid for it as long as you keep the maintenance up and keep the engine oil moving and that sort of stuff. So you can buy an airplane for a certain amount of money and expect to sell it you know, sell it back into the market around about the same money. Um, so for that, the cost, it's cost of, very cost effective to add hours. The other thing we always say, it's always nice to fly your own equipment. It's like driving your own car as opposed to a rental car every day. Yeah, they might be the same make and model, but they always have small nuances, always have little bits that are different, that sort of thing. So it's really important, especially if you're time building for licenses, uh, or taking an IFR or doing some of these higher ratings that you feel really comfortable in the aircraft. Um, you know, nobody ever feels 100% comfortable in airplanes, which is great because you never want to get that complacent. 
But, you know, if you're struggling to figure out where the switches are because it's a different airplane that day than you flew yesterday and yet you're trying to learn how to shoot, you know, approaches, that's a lot of extra workload that you don't need. And so, yeah, for time building, we definitely recommend purchase of an aircraft. It can be a really, really great experience that way. Yeah, if you can afford it, I highly recommend it. We did. We bought uh, the Cessna a month after I got my PPL, and put a couple hundred hours on it and really learned a lot and got to travel. You can take a plane that you own for multiple days without having to worry about the rental. And um, yeah, if, if you can afford it, go for it. Yeah. And that tends to be the big driver, to be honest with you, work. It, usually it's, hey, I want to go somewhere, right? Uh, so I always say, you know, it's great to learn at your home field um, and be comfortable with your airport. But the learning really starts when you branch out past that kind of 25 or 50 nautical mile limit where you're going to airports you don't know. You're talking to tower controllers or terminal controllers or en route controllers that you haven't talked to before. You know, you're seeing stuff that you haven't seen before. That's really where the great learning experiences really come in. And you're right. When you're renting an aircraft, you're only allowed certain periods. You're not necessarily allowed overnights. Um, there is a big portion of get home itis that drives into that when you're renting an aircraft because you know you can't keep it overnight when it's your own and you land somewhere and the weather socks in and you go well doesn't matter right it's just not at the home airport tonight so we'll you know go to the bar and we'll have a quick drink and we'll have a little pizza and we'll go to bed and we'll get up and do it again tomorrow with no pressure to say that airplane's got to be home tonight otherwise we're getting a big charge and you know we're buggering up somebody else's training opportunity down the road so yeah well, I think that's the reason right there to go buy a plane. So yeah, there you go. It's well, safety, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, thank you for uh, answering all those questions. I think that's going to answer a lot of people's questions. Who uh, I put the call out there for questions, and we got probably like 30, 30 people messaging with Great. questions. So it's that's definitely awesome. people are people are trying to find out more. So. Well, yeah, and hopefully we've added a little bit of information to your uh, your listenership for sure. A uh, critical piece is to is to make sure you do your due diligence. Uh, aircraft ownership can be well, you certainly know, and so do I. From it can be very frustrating at times, but there are a lot of upsides for having your own airplane um, and seeing those things and doing those things. That uh, it's pretty hard to outweigh. You know, it outweighs the downside very quickly when you get to have some of these great adventures. And if people want to check out your website and. How do, how do they find you? Yeah, they can find us at www.flightsimple.com. Uh, we also have a U.S. division, which is www.flightsimpleusa.com. Um, or they're hap I'm happy to get emails from folks at info at flightsimple.com. Uh, or they can text us on my number. Um, our website does contain all of our listings at all times. So if we have an aircraft that's listed for sale, it'll be up on the website. Um, we also have a little bit of information about services for selling and buying, uh, kind of the basic information for folks. So, And if they have any questions, please just drop me a line and I'll be happy to answer anything that I can. And uh, yeah, we, we would love to see more folks, especially in Canada. Uh, you know, we've seen a big shift in demographic in pilots over the years. A lot of older pilots are getting out of aviation. A lot of older uh, pilot owners are getting out of aviation. And we're not seeing that critical mass of young folks coming into aviation due to cost constraints and time constraints and things like that. But we're starting to see a bit of a shift in the market where Canadian buyers are getting back in. And we're really excited to see that, uh, you know. The benefit of having more GA in Canada benefits us all, and not just from a, a guy who brokers airplanes, but also a guy who owns one and pays hangar rent and all that kind of stuff too. So uh, we love to see those Charlie tail numbers in the air. Yeah, we want those Canadians to keep buying Canadian planes so they don't all go south of the border. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Or we need yeah. the dollar to go the other way so we can bring them all home. That's We always yeah, that's laugh. Right. That's cyclical that, yeah, when the dollar is strong in the U.S., airplanes tend to go south when the dollar gets better here the airplanes tend to come north just because of the cost efficiencies but no we're uh, we're seeing a lot more canadian pilots involved and and certainly i think you know with folks doing more research and recognizing the things they can do in a ga airplane uh, you know that they maybe can't do in the car or in the airlines um, you know there's a lot more people that are kind of looking into the ownership process and we're really excited to see that Well, there you have it. Thanks, Michael, for joining me today. I hope a lot of your questions were answered and you're ready to embark on buying your first plan. It's so worth it if you can afford it. 
If you have any follow-up questions, fire them over to me on Instagram at Flying British Columbia or an email to podcast at flyingbc.com. If there's enough follow-up discussion, I think this topic could be worth another show. I'm already thinking a show about pre-buy inspections might be a good one. And as always, please share and review the show if you like it. Your word of mouth and sharing with all your pilot friends really helps out. And now, you have control. <laughs>